Hello and welcome to the Career Success Podcast. I'm Jason Connolly. If you're a regular listener, it's great to have you back. But if you're new, welcome to the show. In this series, every week, we speak to the biggest names in business all across the globe. We talk about their career stories, the lessons learned, how they overcome challenges and what success habits they practice. Practical advice to help you in your career. If you have a passion for business, then this is the podcast for you. In this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by John Saunders from just outside of Washington, D.C. in the U.S. John spent more than two decades as a Wall Street senior vice president, sales team leader and an award winning sales executive. John followed his passion for helping others grow and founded a coaching and consultancy company, Forward Advisory Solutions. John is a member of the Georgetown University MBA Alumni Advisory Council, a regular contributor to the MBA mentorship program and an active angel investor. John is also the author of The Optimizer, Building and Leading a Team of Serial Innovators. John, thanks for joining me on this episode. Jason, pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, I've got a lot of questions, but before we kind of delve into all things uh, about your career, tell us about you, because two years as a Wall Street Senior Vice President, that's a long time. But t- tell us, give us a whistle-stop tour of your career, John. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in a household, to, to give a second of the long way, long way back, uh, you know, we just always worked. You know, I had a, I was a paper boy. I delivered the local newspaper when I was a kid and just sort of kept doing that and always trying to work hard. And my parents were always into investing. So they always, they invested for me when I was very young and always kind of kept that in front of me. So when I graduated from college, uh, undergrad, I thought, boy, I really want to work in this industry. It was fascinating to me. And I was lucky enough to land a job in, uh, in Wall Street right out of college, moved to from uh, where I grew up in Wisconsin in the Midwest to New York City. And you know, came in there, I'll say, with my original passion, which was just try to work harder, <laughs> as you uh, <laughs> as you always, uh, as I kind of learned growing up. And after some period of time, uh, a number of promotions, I realized, you know, you have to sort of add a bit more to this. You can't just work harder all the time, you have to work smarter. And stayed in that track. I went and got a couple of designations, professional designations, and then an MBA. And, you know, at the end, after 23 years, found myself a senior vice president running a team with about a $4 billion sales goal. That's a there's a snapshot of it. Yeah, that, that, that's definitely a whistle stop to John. I'm not going to deny that. It's, it sounded bit to, to me when you first kind of get sort of talked through your education, it sounded to me like maybe you didn't come from that kind of uh, background where other people had gone down that path before. Am I reading in between lines? In, in terms of education? Yes. You know, my father was the first. He grew up on a farm. Uh-huh. He was the first of 11 kids to go to school and didn't finish oh, wow. in, uh, undergrad until he was in his 40s. So... Most of you know my young life, he you know didn't have a college degree, and he got it when he was maybe forty five or something like this. Uh, my mom did, but uh, yeah, it was it, my brother and sister. I was the youngest of three. Both did, we went to college as well, but it was certainly part of our lives. But you know, my dad had to change his life to to make that happen. Wow! And uh, what what was it that kind of appealed to you about Wall Street? How did you find yourself in that setting? I, I'm not getting you when I say my parents made an investment for me when I was about three years old. Mm. They did it for all their children put $1,000 in a, a large cap mutual fund and just let it ride. And for at about 21, around my college graduation, my dad called me up one day and he said, hey, you know, what's your social security number? <laughs> he said, I'm going to transfer some money to your name. And I said, what are you talking about? And he transferred this account to me and it was probably worth $25,000 at the time. And I'll never forget him saying, so I was 21, 22. I said, why are you giving me this money? I could do something crazy with it. <laughs> you know, go on vacation, buy a car. You know, I was a senior in mm. college, I think. And he said, uh, Money is about being able to make good choices and having options. And he said, I want you to be able to make better choices and have some options. And I'll never forget that advice. And I think, honestly, right then and there, I was really hit me that I want to go be in this business, be around money and help other people with their investing. Right. And, and it's notoriously difficult to um, get get into Wall Street and to try and get that first break. And did you, did you kind of find that quite difficult to get into uh, Wall Street, as it were? You know, uh, it's one of those things where uh, you are absolutely right. It's uh, they often say it's the hardest place to get into and the hardest to get out of. Is one way uh, someone has framed it mm-hmm. to me. I thought was pretty spot on. And so, you know, I honestly I was a Midwest kid. You know, out, grew up. Yeah, so I was interviewing for jobs in Chicago, Minneapolis, sort of the big cities in the Midwest and financial mm-hmm. services. And as I continued to search and really pound the pavement on trying to get out, uh, trying to get into the industry. Some family friends said, hey, uh, you know, I've got a friend or two on Wall Street. Maybe I could let you talk to them. And uh, I used to get up. This one gentleman was kind enough to take, I think it was a bi-weekly call with me. And he was in New York. He said, I'll talk to you at seven in the morning. 
which was six in the morning where I was. And as a college kid, six in the morning is you know pretty early, at least for my life. And I talked to this guy every other Friday for months and he set me up. And I think he just appreciated the tenacity of someone who's willing to get up at 530 in the morning to talk to him to get ready. And uh, so he set me up with a bunch of interviews with different companies and that really helped. And then uh, a good friend of mine uh, was able to do the same. And just through kind of networking and a little tenacity, I was able to get my foot in the door as a, a sales assistant for a, a team back in 96. And how, how was it that you kind of, was you kind of the the portrait of people that kind of are in Wall Street or is there kind of a typical carbon copy of the the typical Wall Street uh, broker? Uh, you know, they tend to come from, you know, very uh, exclusive schools, you know, mm-hmm. Ivy League schools, things like this. I was not, uh, I, I went to a state school, University of Wisconsin for undergrad and, uh, you know, I think I think they appreciated my tenacity and my friend that referred me in had been there a year or so and built a good track record of, you know, kind of hard working and this kind of thing. And they appreciated him. And when he referred me in, uh, they were happy to talk to me. And I don't know, six interviews later, they uh, offered me a job, which was fantastic. Did you ever t- sort of tend to find that because you'd gone to a different college and university and you'd come from a different place to a lot of people that, you know, that worked to your disadvantage ever or, 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 or was your tenacity so strong that you just powered through that unblinkered? You know, interestingly, Jason, a lot of people sort of treated me like this, you know, sort of farm boy from the Midwest and figured I had cows in my yard and this kind of thing. And it actually worked to my favor because I was constantly underestimated. And, mm. uh, you know, a expectations lot of, were low when you powered on through them. Yeah. And they kind of thought, oh, this simpleton from the Midwest is never going to do anything here. And, you know, fast forward two, three, four years, I was getting promoted past many of my peers at a faster rate. because I was showing up earlier, staying later constantly trying to figure out, you know, how else can I gain more responsibility here? And I've always chased responsibility and, you know, the money always followed and I never chased the money. It was always about how can I do more here? And uh, that was a pretty good strategy. Where did your motivation and drive come from? Where, 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 where did that come from during those years? You know, I, I always played sports as a kid. Mm-hmm. I played soccer, football, as you might call it. And uh, I was just always hyper competitive. And I think that was probably what they liked about me too that they saw that in me. And, uh, you know, I always wanted to get ahead and win and, you know, show people I could do good things for them and uh, do good work. And, you know, as I said early on, that strategy, just sort of the working harder and being competitive really, really paid off. And how did you learn to sort of become a leader? Because I always think managing a team is, it, it's incredibly difficult. It's not easy. And and those are skills that, well, for, for my, you know, obviously we, we've both got different outlooks on life and have come from different places. But like you, John, I, I, I well, I grew up in a council estate in London. So my, my start in life was, well, I went to one of the worst five schools in the country at the time. <laughs> so I think I was also underestimated. But what I had is so much drive, um, and determination to get out of the situation that you know I'd kind of grown up in, but that that's what kind of powered me through. Don't get me wrong; I grew up in a in a family of love, but you know we did, we barely had any two pennies to rub together growing up. What sort of when you uh, sort of become a leader and, and stuff like that? Where did you learn those skills from? Was that was you? Because I don't know what the life on Wall Street's like. Are you kind of taught that those soft skills, or how do you develop those skills? And how obviously you were kind of built up to go in, into that role, but how was it you you learned how to be a successful leader? Because obviously this leads really nicely onto the book, which we will come to soon. Oh, thanks. Uh, you know, leadership was just one of those things, always playing sports. I was, you know, always uh, captain of my soccer team and it just kind of came naturally to me. And I think it was just maybe not being shy and just having this extraordinary drive to want to win and, you know, trying to realize that I had to motivate those around me to you know, I couldn't, there's 11 people on the field, right? <laughs> like one guy can't do it yeah. all. And so I was just always had that mindset. Like, how can I get those around me to help us win this game? Getting into school, you know, getting into Wall Street. I've always had this mindset to sort of learn and improve. And then, you know, how can I help others do the same and raise those around me? And uh, that philosophy, honestly, that simple way to put it is I could almost stop there and that's the rest of the story, but there's a lot more to it. <laughs> and kind of when you move up the the ranks in Wall Street, are the hours still kind of as long as they, as they are when you first entered? Is that just the lifestyle of Wall Street? Uh, I, you know, many times I didn't know when the, if it was morning or night, you know. Oh, right. that, well, that says it all, John. That's the <laughs> answer to my question there. <laughs> <laughs> there were definitely years, especially as you're kind of growing through the ranks and, you know, they really put you through the ringer. If you want to get to the, you know, sort of the good positions, you got to jump through a lot of hoops to get there. And there were plenty of nights where I was, 
driving across some state in the middle of nowhere in the U.S., you know, Ohio at nine o'clock on a Thursday to a hotel only to wake up at five in the morning to fly back home and, you know, go try to see my girlfriend on the weekend or something like this. And then Monday morning back at Reagan National Airport being greeted by my first name before they saw my driver's license. You know, that's always a good yeah. sign, Jason, when the people at the airport know your name and, you know, you haven't shown them your driver's license yet. <laughs> Well, that normally says something, John, especially if you're entering via the back uh, entrance rather than the front. <laughs> I've got just got so many questions about Wall Street because it's absolutely fascinating. And do, do you find that kind of obviously I'm not going to be rude enough, John, to ask your age, but I think the, the decades of experience speak for themselves. Do you think that kind of when you was on Wall Street, it was kind of the, the glory days of Wall Street? Because it's it, it must have changed an absolute load, um, it, it, you know, in the last couple of decades in itself. It was, you know, the late 90s where mm. the, the getting was good for sure. The uh, sort of low cost products, the ETFs, uh, the low cost trading products that are out available now, were just starting to get going. So margins were still very wide business. You know, every time you brought in a dollar, you know, the profit margins were near 40 percent, and mm. that, which is huge, right? Uh, compare that to, say, a grocery store where margins are two or three percent, right? Or many industries that are kind of 10 you know, we were high 30s, 40. And that has come down in the last, you know, five to 10 years and it's accelerating. Mm. Uh, but yeah, the late 90s were, the getting was pretty good for sure. And it continued on. It really, it was probably since 08. So, you know, the great recession of 08 that kind of really started to put pressure on margins and the competition got a lot more, really took a new, uh, took another step forward, if you will. And when you became um, senior vice president, how long did it take you to get to that position? Uh, let's see, 96 to 2014. So what is that about uh, 19 years, I guess, 18, 19 years. And when you kind of got up to that level and you, you, you kind of rose those ranks, what was life like kind of being at the top of a Wall Street organization? You know, it's interesting as you think you get to these kind of roles, you think mm. life's only going to get better and you're going to have more control. And in fact, uh, <laughs> the opposite was true. <laughs> you, uh, were, your time was in demand more and people mm. wanted to talk to you and meet with you and you had to be you know, fly to New York all the time uh, at a very short notice for different meetings and things like this. So yeah, ironically, as you'd think you'd sort of, with a bigger job, you'd have more control, you you actually had less. Uh, John, I've, I found that myself from uh, my, my experience of growing a bit. It's, yeah. it's, I think I had a very different view when I started to what life would be like, to what it's actually like in reality. So uh, right. I can definitely uh, understand that. What was kind of the career highlight for you at your time uh, of being a senior vice president? That's an interesting one. Just to put you on the spot. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I've answered that question before. I'm going to have to think about that for a second. You know, I, I'll tell you this. and The realizing that I could help people have this really big light bulb moment go off just by asking them questions and seeing them identify, you know, I really worked hard on problem definition, not problem solution. So if a team member came to me and said, hey, Jason or John, I'm really stuck on this. Instead of saying, hey, call this person or do that, I really learned to say, hey, what have you tried? Why did you go that? Mm. Why did you take that approach? How has it worked out so far? What else have you tried? And if you can go through that series of questions and take more of what I would call a trusted advisor approach as opposed to a you know, manager or boss approach, if you will, and help mm. them. I mean, I could hear the light bulb going off even over the phone where they'd say, if they, through those series of questions, if they could identify the answer themselves, even if it was highly likely the answer I might have given them anyway, through the questions kind of guiding them there and helping them define this problem so they could run and chase a solution. That was a, I will call that a big highlight. And when I saw that happen mm. and really saw people be empowered by that, that was, I knew I was onto something with that. And that was really exciting to see them grow and, uh, you know, run with mm. an idea and take ownership of it. Well, it's a really interesting way of uh, kind of mentoring people as such to let them figure out the, the answers themselves. There's something quite powerful uh, about that and but funny enough I, I've got much of a similar approach when it comes to things myself I think to give the answer do doesn't mean a lot a lot of the time to get someone to kind of go through that thought process can be very powerful right it's kind of that you know sort of give a man a fish he eats for a day right teach a man to fish he eats for a lifetime and I, I very much uh, I kind of played around with that and certainly I went to business school in about 2015 graduate MBA an MBA program and mm. uh, you know I learned a lot through some peers in my company, mentors, but also business school taught me an immense amount about this. And it was pretty amazing to go through business school while I was doing the senior vice president role, because 
I constantly used my own team as kind of my testing ground. You know, I'd learn this new oh, thing right. in class okay. and then I'd go and try it on my team and say, this worked, that didn't, what should I, you know, what should I keep pushing on? And uh, that was pretty awesome to see. Really interesting. And I think this kind of leads really nicely onto the questions I want to ask about the book. The book's called, uh, as I said in the introduction, The Optimizer, Building and Leading a Team of Serial Innovators. Tell us, rather than me read the description out, uh, John, tell us um, your take on kind of the book, what it's all about, what kind of motivated you as well to, to write a book, because that's no mean feat. Yeah, I'll start with the, the motivation. I think that's an interesting place to start, which mm. is I saw so many people over my years on Wall Street and now even as a coach that are so talented and yet their gifts lay hidden for years, sometimes forever. And what I found, Jason, was the key, the key link to the problem was change brings fear. And people don't want to face the fear of, oh, I tried something new. I, I tried to innovate and it didn't work. And now I have to tell my friends, my boss, my spouse, whatever, that I failed right? Fear. Mm. There's fear, there's loss, there's uncertainty. All these emotional charges go along with it. So now juxtapose that against the fact that if you're a manager or a leader, your job is largely about driving change and getting your team to improve and grow, right? So there's this huge conflict there that I don't think gets enough attention in the world. So my whole idea was, if I can get you to think in this optimizer mindset or incremental constant improvement mindset, uh, one, you know, one, three, six months goes by and you're going to have a lot done if you're every week allocating an hour or two or three to this sort of innovation mindset, making incremental change. And two, it helps you overcome that emotional burden that I talked about earlier that often stifles or stalls change. And that's really the, the crux of the book, how to overcome that as a manager and really enable, empower your team to adopt this mindset and run with it. And, and with, with the book, was this all kind of your own learnings and, uh, what, what you saw around you, or have you taken inspiration from other places? So the book is, it's a, a combination of my own work, of an enormous amount of research I did, mm -hmm. and probably two dozen or so interviews with people across industries, from a cult winemaker in Napa Valley, to a luxury interior designer, to a Microsoft executive, to the co-founder of The Motley Fool, a financial services company in America, mm. to a bunch of others. So I, a principal of a public school system. I originally started out thinking I'll make this book for Wall Street. And as I kind of went a bit adjacent to Wall Street people and started interviewing outside of that audience, I realized these lessons aren't Wall Street lessons. They're leadership lessons. And that's when I really started to expand my search mm. and, and research and interviews. And was there kind of common, when you spoke to all these different companies, is there kind of a common theme that you tend to come across that stopping uh, companies moving forward or innovation? Is it is it a cultural issue or? Cultural issue, leadership issue. And, and many times mm. you can't blame the leaders. They just don't know, or it's the culture they grew up in and they haven't sort of thought to, or found a way to, or felt safe enough to do things differently themselves. On a, on a positive note, the common themes where this was happening, where this mindset was out there, this constant innovation mindset, you know, they made people feel safe. They empowered them to step out of their comfort zone and try things new and encourage them to educate themselves. And it was really cool to see that across so many different organizations. And I, I appreciate we're not going to ever unpack the whole book during this episode, but I want to try and get as much value, John, out of you yeah. as I possibly can. Thank you. Thank you. In terms of uh, kind of what, what you just mentioned about um, people feeling safe and people feeling empowered to kind of come out with these ideas, how do you even go about that? How do you create that space? You know, or, or does the whole book contain that? And we're never going to unpack that in such a short amount of time. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I can certainly share some of the part of that mm, story here. Oh, please and, do. Uh, a big part of it is, you know, the enabling part to me is entire. So it's how do you enable, empower, and sustain this mindset? That's really the crux of the book. The, the enabling part, it, it's all built on trust. One of the things I found is building trust should be in your business plan. It should be on your calendar as a leader. And what I found is many people take it for granted. Hey, we pay you a lot of money, Jason. You're going to figure it out. Okay. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. That attitude still, you know, it's not, it's not as pervasive as maybe it was five or 10 years ago, but it's still out there. And mm. or people just don't even think about it. You work here, you know, we give you, we've granted you this gift of a job. And so therefore you're going to just listen to me and take everything I say for granted. And I would argue that isn't enough. You need to have personal relationships with these people. You need to enable them by getting their feedback and asking them for advice, you know, give them credit when they come up with good ideas and be as transparent as you can. These are the building blocks, in my view, to enabling this mindset. 
let's take you for an example, Jason. I mean, mm. do you take advice from someone or that, that you don't feel like you trust and has your best interests at heart? Well, no, John, I don't. <laughs> of course, right? Like you walk onto a, you know, let's say a car deal, you know, a car lot and, you know, you're like, mm. oh, I want to buy a car today. And, you know, you might be a little suspicious of that person's motivations and obviously they don't know you that well. And, mm. It's so funny because trust is a very intangible thing, John. It's h- how do you build a trust, I guess, if we strip it back that far? Because I know that I get these kind of gut feelings and these intuitions about trust, but it's very intangible. It's how does one manager go about building trust in, in their team? Or is it about, you know, the team realizing that their intentions are, you know, are ultimately in the right place? I'll give you an example that maybe a story might answer that question better than sort of listing things. Mm. Uh, mm. So there was, I constantly asked my team for feedback. You know, hey, how, how is this working out? How, how could we do this better? How might we uh, you know, operate better? What's it like working with me? How could I be a better manager for you? What are your goals? Like, I was constantly asking them these questions. And I will tell you early on, the response to those questions was very mundane because they didn't trust me yet. They, you know, mm. Who is this guy asking me all these questions? You know, how can you tell a boss what's it like working with yeah, him? Yeah, what's his honest? motivation? What's, right. his, what's he trying to get at? <laughs> and so what, the breakthrough for me was such a simple thing. Like the bar is lower than you think. One of my favorite data points in the book, or I shouldn't say favorite, but one of the most alarming was one in four employees in the US feel completely ignored by their manager. Well, that's mm. a, from Gallup. And uh, so I went to this one gentleman who'd been with the firm forever. He was new on my team. I was a peer of his for years. Now I'm his manager. And I said, we do, this is, uh, it was a remote team. We were all scattered around uh, the the East coast of the U.S. And uh, I said to him, you know, gosh, we have all these conference calls. I just basically took over the conference call schedule of my predecessor, which was every other week we'd have a call. And I said to him, Brian, I don't feel like we're getting very far with these calls. How do you think we can improve communication amongst our team and really make it more valuable? And he said to me, Jason, something to the effect of, get rid of a bunch of the calls. We have too many. (laughs) And I thought, well, there's an honest answer. Uh, Mm. And so I go on the calendar and I had the whole calendar year mapped out already. And I just simply took the calls that fell on a holiday. And I would normally, like a Monday holiday, I would just move the call to a Tuesday. I just took those those calls and canceled them. It said, instead of pushing it to Tuesday, we're just going to get rid of it. And I got rid of maybe 15% of the calls in doing that. And then I sent a note out to the team. Hey, everybody, Brian had a great idea. He thinks we have too many calls. So we're going to try this new pilot this year. Pilot is a very powerful word in leading change because it feels non-permanent and it helps people. It also, I think, it welcomes them into the journey of change, not just saying, hey, Jason, here's a new thing we're doing. Here's a pilot, right? Different. It's, it's, it's a very nuanced Yeah, messaging, no, but I, it's I very completely important. agree with you. I, I think it's a great word. That was a key word I learned. Rather in, than test, it, the, the test me makes it seem like you're not sure on what you're doing. Pilot sounds like you're sure that there's something great coming, but it's it's a trial. And yeah, a, a and trial you, doesn't sound like a nice word. That sounds like it's not here to stay. I like that word, pilot. I found it to be probably one of the most powerful words I learned as a leader. And so mm. I put the message out to the team. So I asked the guy for feedback. I took his advice. I took action with it. And then I sent a note out to the team. Hey, everyone, Brian had this idea. We're going to have fewer calls this year and pilot this new schedule. Fast forward to the end of the year, uh, last call of the year. And I said, hey, everyone, you know, we've been on this pilot. It's about to end. The calendar year is over. Should we bring the old schedule back? And not one person said a word. <laughs> not one. And I thought, <laughs> you know, it, here's the ironic part. If I needed to have an extra call and get a message out, big deal. I just scheduled it and we did it. But they weren't tethered to this every other Monday thing mm. uh, for the whole year. They appreciated it. And after that little exercise that I just explained to you, ask for feedback, take action, give the guy credit for it. Uh, people really started to lean in. So how do you build trust? You let your actions show that they can trust you and that you'll take ideas from them. Uh, and I've got a question then, John. So you, you kind of have a team, but maybe you think that there's, um, you know, a kind of a bad apple in the team or someone that's, you know, not going to get on board with any of these ideas. Uh, you know, is your is your philosophy simply if, if it can't be changed, get rid or? Yeah, unfortunately, there were people over the years that mm. didn't get it. And I worked with them for months and months to kind of say, hey, look, this is the direction I think Mm. we need to go in. If you think I'm wrong, let's talk about it. But this is where we're headed. And this is how I think we get Mm. there. And you, I need you to be a big part of it. And because we were remote workers, you know, I didn't see them every day. Some people thought they could get away with that for a long time, but sooner or later that catches up to you. And so there were a handful of people that, you know, it's 
firing people is the worst thing to do. I mean, it's just mm. nothing fun about it. But unfortunately, I did have to make some changes over the years. And what's the feedback been in the reception? Because the book's obviously been published now, well, six months uh, in this country, according to Google. Uh, yeah. John, what, what's kind of been the, the reception to people for, from you publishing it? And I must add on, on that note, you have a tremendous amount of five-star reviews from people giving beautiful feedback, uh, just to add that before you, uh, before you answer. I really appreciate that. It, it's been so fun. And I have to tell you, uh, I never really thought I'd write a book. It started out as a paper. And then mm-hmm. I showed it to a friend. He said, "Make it. why don't you make it a series? And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And put it on LinkedIn every week for a month or something. Took it to another friend who said, hey, I can help you fine tune this thing. I do some, you know, he'd worked in publishing. And uh, then took it to a professor at my business school right before Christmas of 19. And he said, I was trying to help you know, to sort of work with him to get it published in Forbes or something. And he said, uh, I think you have the makings of a book here. Fast forward, I said, how do you do that? And he introduced me to an author coach and that's really where mm. the whole thing started. Because I'm, sure, I'm not sure I answered your question there. Oh no, no, because no, <laughs> I, I read I read one review and it said at a time when uh, resilience is no longer optional and innovation is the only anecdote to disruption, and it's it, it, that was quite a powerful statement when I read that, and I thought you, you know yes we're in a complex world. Um, things are changing kind of at super speed, it feels like these days. And I, I think that it you've got to keep up and you've got to innovate and you've got to do things that other people aren't doing. And if you're a business that's kind of stood still and, you know, you're not kind of embracing change in some way or another, then you're, you're going to get left behind. And I think there's so many businesses, which even I can think of myself, John, that have kind of fallen a uh, victim of of not moving with the times and i'm sure well i only have to say blockbuster as an example yeah i uh, they were one i considered citing in the book but uh, i ended up pulling it at the last minute but yeah agreed and i guess to answer your question more directly mm. it, it has just opened so many doors for me uh you know a number of my coaching engagements i'm very happy to report have been inbound requests hey you know this story you have here what uh, is very practical. It's applicable. It's, you know, I think we can do something here and, you know, optimize our operations. And uh, that's been really, really, I've just been really fortunate in that regard. And I think this is a fascinating story, John. I really appreciate the insight that you've given to us. Just to kind of bring this back to, you know, it is a difficult time for a lot of young people at the moment, kind of coming out of university in a world that hasn't, isn't just changing through innovation. It's also changing through things like the pandemic. What, you know, what advice would you maybe give to someone that maybe hasn't gone to um, the best universities, trying to find their way, trying to get into a company and perhaps is knocking on the door and not being heard? You know, think about the analogy I like to use is the seesaw, right? That old kid's thing where you're, you know, one kid is on one side and the other kid's on the other side and the, the heavier kid goes <laughs> to the ground, right? And lifts the other one up. I, I think about that in terms of the value that you bring. And how do you bring value to an organization? And so instead of just knocking on their door and saying, hey, I went to this school or, or you know, this, go out and create something. Go out and write a paper. Go out and maybe write a book or do something, write a blog that's relevant to their organization. You've got to differentiate yourself. That is such a, a key part of this. And I don't think it matters where you come from. Uh, you know, the author coach that I worked with, the program has students from all over the world. And many of them, mm-hmm. you know, they range from, I say at the young at 18, to, you know, probably 50 to 60 years old, constantly astounded how many people come to the program that are in college, university kids, you know, 18, mm. 20 years old, 22, whatever. Um, so go out and create something, find a way to create real value in the world and differentiate yourself. Be more than just a, a resume. And, and ha- if you've got a voice, let it be heard and do something that's going to add value and be different. And that's the, the message I'm taking from that uh, sentiment, John. Yeah. And don't be afraid. Absolutely. And, and I'll put a finer point on that. The opening story in my book is about when I was on Wall Street, my career stalled a bit. And I kind of thought, gosh, I'm at 25 years old and I'm, I can't get promoted anymore. <laughs> you know, and, uh, I went to a mentor and said, what should I do here? I'm kind of feeling kind of stuck. And he said, you know, why don't you go find some volunteer work? And mm. I sort of snooped around a bunch and found a film festival in New York City. I was living there at the time. And I became the director of sponsorship for this film festival and raised a bunch of money for them and developed this entirely new skill set way outside of my comfort zone, right? I'm on Wall Street. Now I'm doing fundraising for you know the arts world, if you will. And boy, if that experience didn't completely change the trajectory of my career, because then I brought these new skills and knowledge back to my Wall Street job and I looked at it entirely differently. And sure enough, the next promotion rolled around and I got it and my career really took mm. off from there. So getting outside your comfort zone is the moral of that story. 
And I think you, 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 I, I think I've become an expert, John, at being outside of my comfort zone. I think I've spent most of the last decade well outside of my comfort zone. It'd be nice to actually be within the comfort zone for once. <laughs> so, and, and thank you so much. It's a beautiful story. If people want to find out more about you, or indeed they want to find out more about the optimizer, where can they go to? Sure. Uh, my website is my name, John with an H, C Saunders, S A U N D E R S, John C Saunders.com, or uh, my uh, social media handles are JCS underscore optimizer, like the name of the book. And the book is available for nine, only nine dollars, John, on Kindle. It's a bargain. You're very kind. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining me. It's been an absolute delight to speak to you. And thank you for the insight that you've shared with us, John. I really enjoyed the conversation, Jason. Thanks for having me. That was John Sanders from Washington, D.C. in the U.S. I'm Jason Connolly. This is the Career Success Podcast. Until next time, goodbye.